All right, welcome to day two. Hello, everybody. We're gonna get right to it. We have on tack deck for you today, imagine the past, imagine the future, historical and speculative fiction. What do these two genres have in common? We are gonna find out with our gorgeous panelists here. Christopher Lewis from Magueta is gonna be moderating this discussion, guiding us through it. He'll be joined by Daniel Jose Older, Katie Simpson-Smith, and Alex Jennings. And without further ado, I am going to take it away. let Chris take it away. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming here on uh, a cold morning. <laughs> um, I'm going to read uh, uh, the bios real quick of our three panelists and try not to interrupt myself by bowing because we have three <laughs> amazing authors here. Um, and yeah, then we're gonna, uh, they're going to read a little bit uh, from their amazing books that are all for sale with Candace in the corner. Uh, and then we'll get into our discussion. Uh, I'll try to leave a little bit of time for Q&A uh, if anyone has any questions. Uh, if we're getting late, feel free to like wave me down because I will probably just talk to them all day uh, if I'm not notified. <laughs> but yeah, to start, we have uh, Katie Simpson Smith was uh, born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi. She is the author of the novels The Story of Land and Sea, a New York Times book review editor's choice, and one of Vogue's best books of 2014, Freeman and The Everlasting, a New York Times best historical fiction book of 2020. Her writing has also appeared in the Washington Post, the Paris Review, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Oxford American, Granta, and elsewhere. She received a PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and an MFA from the Bennington Writing Seminars. And is also, also the author of We Have Raised All of You, Motherhood in the South, 1750 to 1835. She lives in New Orleans. We are very happy about that. <laughs> Woo! Yes. <laughs> Clap, whistle, kazoo. Yeah. Um, uh, to my direct right, I have Daniel Jose Older, a uh, lead story architect for Star Wars, The High Republic. Um, he is a New York Times bestselling author of the upcoming young adult fantasy novel, Ballad and Dagger, which is book one of the Outlaw of Saints series. Uh, the sci-fi adventure, Flood City, the monthly comic series, The High Republic Adventures. His other books include the historical fan fantasy series, Dactyl, Hill Squad. Uh, the Book of Lost Saints, which he's holding right here. Uh, the Bone Street Roomba fan Urban Fantasy Series, Star Wars The Last Shot, and the young adult series The Shadow Shaper Cipher, uh, including uh, Shadow Shaper, which was named one of the best fantasy books of all time by Time Magazine and one of Esquire's 80 books every person should read. He won the International Latino Book Award and has been nominated for the Kirkus Prize, the World Fantasy Award, the Andre Norden Award, the Locus, and the Mythopoeic Award. He co-wrote the upcoming graphic novel, Death's Day, and you can find more info, and there is more info, <laughs> and read about his decade-long career as an NYC parad uh, paramedic at danieljoseholder.net. Kazoo. <laughs> and, to my furthest right, I have Alex Jennings, who is a lifelong fan and creator of science uh, fiction, who lives in New Orleans. His writing has appeared in The Podcastle, The Podunk Review, excellent magazine, <laughs> uh, Obsidian Lit, The Locus Award-winning Luminescent Threads, Connections to Octavia Butler, <clears throat> and in numerous anthologies, including New Suns, Speculative Fiction by People of Color, New Suns 2, and Africa Risen. His speculative poetry review column, chapter and verse, appears regularly in magazine of fantasy and science fiction. He is a graduate of Clarion West and the University of New Orleans. He received the inaugural Imagination Unbound Fellowship to the Under the Volcano Guided Writing Retreat in 2022. Jennings served as MC and co-producer of the popular literary reading series, Dogfish, from 2014 until 2020. He was born in Wiesbaden, Germany, and raised in G Gaboron? Haberone. Haberone, my apologies. Haberone. Uh, Botswana. Uh, and Paramuribo, Suriname, and uh, Tunis, in Tunisia. As well as uh, the Columbia, Maryland. His debut novel, The Ballad of Perilous Graves, is available wherever books are sold. So, 
You want to start reading? Sure. Thank you. Uh, hey, everybody. Very nice to be here on this chilly morning. This is uh, the Book of Lost Saints. And uh, it's narrated by the spirit of a woman who disappeared during the Cuban Revolution and has reemerged in uh, modern day New Jersey to haunt her nephew, who's a kind of a lug, a slug, a, a lump. And uh, he's a DJ and a hospital security guard, and she's just sort of bothering him. Um, so here, here we find her contemplative. They came in boats and airplanes, armed with false documents and holy terror and a grinding waveriness of what they would find. They came and breathed sigh after sigh of relief, closed their eyes and put trembling hands to foreheads. They came and settled into these flashy modern digs, cursed at the atrocious weather, renamed streets without English sharp consonants, erected bakeries and memorials and three-star restaurants that reminded them just enough of home not to trigger nightmares. They came and left behind family members clutching photographs and promises to send money and frequent letters and powdered milk or vacuum cleaners or whatever was impossible to find that year. They left behind true loves and mistresses and streets pulsing with memories. Each brought along a cord that stretched all the way back to the island and when they slept, each prayed the cord would send along news from home until slowly, each one came to call this place home and the cords wavered beneath the weight of the present tense. They came and made Miguelitos and Carlitos and Anitas and Selinitas, and they told the little ones stories, tried to remember as best they could, but always came up with folk tales. No matter how hard they tried, their stories always felt like lies. They cringed at half-learned Spanish and pan-Asian vegetarian takeout, and then they tried it, and they didn't mind it so much. And life rumbled along with new updates, now flashing across computer screens instead of pulled from weather-worn envelopes smelling of the past. They came and made new lives, and me, I got lost in the shuffle, somewhere in between, became a part of that great semi-sentient we, and disappeared. I don't know, I'm still piecing it all together, but those strands, those many lives, I feel them. They are obvious to me, as clear as words scrawled on a notebook page. A place speaks, and maybe to you it's just the ambient chug -lug of everyday life, the buzz of a light fixture, the hum of a power generator, the occasional blurt and sputter of traffic. To me, each place carries stories, and they sometimes whisper and sometimes yell. People, too, of course, just walk around with all their stories hanging around them like so many chattering birds. It's just past sunset and snowing when Ramon gets to his front door. Not the graceful dancing kind of snow, but a soggy, drenching mess that sloshes out of the night sky and becomes instant brown crud in the streets. Even I feel it, a shudder that ripples to my source, and I find myself lingering closer to Ramon as if to soak up some of that good flesh and blood warmth. So alive, this useless boy man. All his cluttered organs and gushy pumping liquids, all that life, a waste, really. No one who has it knows the true meaning of inhabiting form. We, we watch silently as you lumbering chunks of skin and fat trundle through existence, striving for meaning, and we chuckle and moan at the irony of it. But you who inhabit those mortal bags, you guys just don't get it. <laughs> well, Ramon's face tightens with the uncertain sensation that he's been defeated before he realized he was playing. His fists clench in his pockets, yes from the cold, but also from some undescribed frustration that lurks. You see? Useless. He fumbles for his keys, fingers stiff from the cold. I could soothe him, but this is not the time, nor is it my purpose. The culmination of all my work and travel is not to brighten some behemoth's foul mood on a winter night, even if the behemoth is my nephew. No, timing is everything. If I get sloppy now, I risk it all. Thank you. Um, that was amazing. So you were reading about a dead person lusting after the organs of a live person. So I might read about a live person lusting after the organs of a dead person. Oh, dead. <laughs> Big fan of symmetry. Big <laughs> fan of symmetry. Okay, so um, the, one of the characters in this book is a crypt keeper, and his job, he lives in the ninth century in Rome, and his job is to uh, contemplate the 
bodies of all the deceased monks who have gone before him. Um, they are propped up on seats in a little room beneath the chapel um, called a putridarium. And this is a little explanation of how Felix, this character, got his job. After dinner, the brotherhood divided into cleaners and singers, and Felix, as he often did, chose the former task, finding relief in busy hands. Stack the bowls, wipe the tables, sweep the floors, scrub the pots, toss the dirty water on the cabbages, chuck the oily sand in the outhouse, gather the carrot tops and wilted chard and bristle in a basket, and visit them upon the happy chickens who bump their hips in a scramble to the door, their heads leading their legs by a seemingly dangerous margin. And all this to the singing brother's tune, a quiet chant if the weather was wet and cold, or a full-throated foot stomper, their more restful chore never begrudged, for Felix found the greater pleasure in listening. And anyway, his own warble wasn't pleasing, as his mother was careful to tell him on his first attempt to join the chorus of voices in the country church. He must have been six. Oh, my love, she had said, and put a hand over his mouth. Let's allow the angels to have their turn. <laughs> it was too dark to see the broom now, so Felix affixed a new candle in his holder, a small brass cup with a ring for his thumb, and took it to the outhouse to sit for half an hour with his begrudging bowels. When he crossed back to the church, Brother Benedictus was kneeling closer to the altar than was customary, and when Felix raised a hand in greeting, he shuffled back. No harm in wanting to touch God. And yet neither Benedictus, nor the newest novitiate, nor most of the brothers had any interest in traveling to the subterranean reaches of this holy space to watch God at his most visible. The last keeper at the putridarium had died two years before, and Father Peter scrambled to find someone willing to tend the corpse of the tender. Felix's singing was poor, his manuscript illumination haphazard, his understanding of the chemistry involved in baking perilously inexact. But he was not squeamish, and he believed, as his mother had told him, that the body was a manifestation of God's love for us. This had been included in her list of reasons why young boys should refrain from abusing their most special parts. The penis also belonged to God and should never be handled with more than sober devotion, as one would hold a ewer of holy water. <coughs> This image proved very peaceful to young Felix when he masturbated. <laughs> so the father had blessed Felix, some said punished him, with a key to the crypt. Okay, so in this section, my title character, Perilous Perry Graves, is on a little bit of a side quest for a weapon uh, to help him fight the forces of darkness. Dinkin led Perry through a large, high-ceilinged kitchen and touched a disguised panel on the wall beside the stainless steel refrigerator. The appliance glided out of its stall and rolled silently to the left. Now a doorway stood revealed. Perry followed her through it and down a short flight of steps where a dormant torch stood nestled in a sconce on the wall. She grabbed the torch and it flared to life. Then they started down, down again. Perry, you're so smart, Dinkin said. You've such a curious mind. What you need to understand is that there are situations where orderly, rational thought won't help you. When you won't be able to ask the right questions because the answers can only come in the language of spirits. Perry hoped Dinkin wouldn't see him shake his head at the idea. Now the smooth walls had given way to rougher stone as the stairway curved down the rocky wall. Perry smelled stone, moss, lichen, and far below, water? What was the point of climbing so high only to descend again? And hadn't Dinkin said these islands were eggs from the world serpent? Shouldn't there be a titanic fossilized embryo in here? Perry, Dinkin groaned. We came up the mountain, but we're not going down inside it. We're somewhere else. Do you have to read my mind all the time? I'm trying to help you, Munchkin. Perry swallowed and walked silently for a time as he turned her words over in his mind. He looked over his shoulder again to tell Dinkin her words made no sense. Instead of a woman or a giant following behind him, Perry saw a six-foot pillar of holy blazing fire. 
The light abraded his mind, threatened to scour his consciousness away. Perry barked a shout and pressed his hands over his eyes. He still saw the fire this way, but maybe it wouldn't kill him. Maybe... Perry blinked, disoriented. Dinkin was grasping his shoulder tightly with her free hand and shaking him as she held her torch in the other. Hey! Hey! What? 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 When she saw he had returned to himself, Dinkin stopped shaking him. I don't know where I am, Perry said. I don't know where I am, and I'm going to die here. Yes, Dinkin said darkly, you very much will, unless you get it together. <laughs> Thank you all so much for reading. And, uh, having read all three of your books, it's so nice hearing y'all say it, because I, I can picture it. And then like, there's an extra element to hearing y'all do the damn thing, so to speak. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so for my first question, what's your favorite color? No, uh, my first question, um, especially since we're talking about books that both go in the past, uh, in the future, but also somewhat, uh, particularly in your book, Alex, like, like in an alternate, you know, because I'm not sure if it's past or future, but it's kind of like an alternate reality, um, or alternate universe, parallel universe. Um, how do you all go about, like, world building in a way that feels so thorough, but it doesn't necessarily, like, bog me down, like, I feel like I'm reading, you know, an anthropological study of the world, like, I'm very much feel like I'm in a plot, character-heavy books. And anyway. Everyone's looking at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll start. Um, it's a great question, and thank you. Um, I guess the best way to think of it is, I, I think we all know, like you, you know, you do all this research, and not that much of it ends up in the in the book, and that's kind of like the joy and the sorrow of it is like you find out all these really cool things, and if you can't fit them in, they have to go. So there's an element of it that's almost like the equivalent to the killing your darlings, uh, you know, idea that we talk about in editing a lot. Um, but I also think of it. I think the best way to think of world building is that you have a palette. And all the research you've done, or if it's fantasy, all of the, you know, brainstorming and world building that you've done, or what have you, that's your palette. And you deploy your characters across this world, and as different things come up, you have that palette to freely draw from. Um, it's not a checklist, you know, you're not trying to go down it and just make sure you hit all the main points. But being familiar with it as you are, you kind of know what you have. So knowing that, you do kind of like lead your characters in certain directions, hoping that, you know, things will come up naturally in the course of the story that you can use. Um, but I do think that's the challenge and that's the, that's the ultimate balance. It's like you know all these cool things and exciting things and you have analysis, but you also, at the end of the day, story is king, queen, joker, everything else of what you're doing. You have to be beholden to that above all else. Yeah, I love the image of the palette. Um, that resonates a lot with me. Um, the, the metaphor I came up with was more sculptural. It's like you do all this research and you're, you're all that comes into this like giant block of marble, and uh, your job as the storyteller is to carve away all this that you don't need. Um, but it's not like that research is wasted because okay. it's it's like a journey that you as a writer get to go on. It's a pleasure of being a writer is to gather all the material, um, and it informs the way you talk about character, the way you um, create setting. Um, it's like the the substrate on which everything is built. Um, but then what you get to present to the reader is this very expertly carved, small statue. And it's like, hello, enjoy. Um, and that should be purely a good story um, with compelling characters and all the rest of the stuff has, has been sort of stripped away. Um, I like all of those metaphors. Um, for me, I think of it more as a process of set dressing. Um, while my book is largely set in an alternate New Orleans that's sort of divorced from time, um, in order to make it live and breathe, I felt I needed to pull detail from many different eras of the city and even maybe speculate on the larger future of the city and draw elements from that as well. Um, so it, it came out of a process of learning the city, learning the music and the culture, um, both formally and informally. I, uh, like when I was starting the book, I took a course on New Orleans music history from Connie Atkinson at UNL, and uh, that helped mightily. 
Mm. Uh, she's just an encyclopedia of, of knowledge on that front. Man, it's so interesting you say that because I, I came up as an organizer before I was a writer. And um, one of the groups that I was working with was the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, who's from out of here. Um, at the time, I was in New York and, and Massachusetts. And one of the things that they do is called the foot analysis. And it's like basically asking the question, like, what is the foot that's kicking the ass of the community? And they'll take, <laughs> you know, the room through this whole exercise to kind of map out like a block in their city and what does it look like and what are the different powers that play into it, whether it's community power, institutional power, you know, and understand that in the context of racism. And that as a workshop that I did over and over as an organizer really fed me as a writer when I would go on to then do world building in terms of thinking about power, you know, thinking about the dynamics of the street and what it puts at play. And also like how does that street tell a story, right? Like how like she, the character says in the book, like all this Streets are constantly just vomiting up these stories of, of history of everything else, and then it's for us to figure out like how do we then bring that to life, right? Right. I mean, they they say that in order to write effectively, you need to live a life worth commenting on. I, I think <laughs> that's both a, a life of the, of the mind mm -hmm. and uh, a literal life. Mm. So, with the foot analysis, do you like? apply that to characters too? You're like, what's the foot that's kicking this character? <laughs> I, sometimes I'll try to place the characters within the larger context of the power situation okay. around them. Okay. Um, but I think it could work like on multiple levels. Like one, yeah. I did it in Cuba one, at one point, um, and we talked about the Orishas, the spirits you know, in Cuba, and what those powers do and how they deal with the street, and then it was overlaid with like the institutional power analysis. So like, it's so cool because it changes wherever you go, and you know, who you're talking to will depend on kind of the different feedback that you get. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a lot of fun. I think it's just, um, I think it's interesting what you were saying, Alex, in that uh, in particular where like you need to live a life worth commenting on, which fingers crossed, but no, uh, you know, but yeah, like there's that essay and I can't remember the person right now, so I apologize to the writer, but uh, you know, from I feel like early internet days for me where it's like, you know, you have to fail at something else almost to become a successful writer. Like, it can't be the first thing you have to like, you know, which as a five foot nine basketball player was easy for me to fail <laughs> early, but, um, but you know, uh, but yeah, I think it's interesting, especially considering that you all went to metaphors that like are, you know, divorced from writing right. to an extent, <laughs> totally. which is helpful, you know, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in the point of metaphor, but like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's really interesting. Like, yeah, thank you all. I'm gonna think of palettes and sculptures and that for a while. Um, since we're kind of, I'm going to swerve in order, I know I sent you all some questions, but, oh, I you know, um, the colada's kicking in. Uh, we were talking about, since we're talking about other art forms or whatnot, I was curious, all three of you have been implemented in, through these three books, in particular, like, song and music in different ways. And I thought it was interesting, like, the idea of not only were you all building a world that, like, building worlds in different times, past, present, future, alternate, but also that you were somehow being able to incorporate music, which I thought was really effective. Can you all kind of speak to the process of how you created music or how you like created like playing off of songs? And, you know, in Book of Lost Saints, it was, you know, the mixing. Um, Alex, I believe in the last panel I saw, you say that you wrote the lyrics, which sounded like, like I, I would have thought they were actual New Orleans songs. Like, oh, wow. Public domain. -y. That's crazy. So like, yeah, I'm really curious about how you all thought process on the, on the lyrics and songs and music. Uh, well, uh, when I originally drafted the book, it had all real songs in it, and uh, I was told by my publisher right. that it was not a thing that I was going to do. I've been there. Uh, so I had to go back through and try to create lyrics that would suggest the real songs, that had the, the sort of flavor and rhythm of them. Um, and I, I, I wasn't sure it was going to work. Uh, but it turned out that it did. I, I think there's maybe three real songs in the book. There's St. James Infirmary, uh, and I forget what the other ones are. But uh, I just, I listen to music constantly when writing this book, and I try for musicality in just the prose itself. And so it seemed natural to incorporate that into the book, especially since it's born out of my love for New Orleans, and the music of New Orleans is the, the bit of the city that first made its way to me when I was like four. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think um, I 
I have a book coming out in the spring, and I tried to put some Beach Boys lyrics in there. <laughs> <laughs> nope. And got into this like months long battle yeah. with like a record company. I was like, this is not worth it. <laughs> so, wouldn't it be nice? It's no longer in my novel. It would have been nice. It would have been nice. Yeah, I think like music and like art and like all these other forms are are parallel worlds with with writing and the work of writing. And so when we bring them into our novels, it's a way to step outside of the like kind of like painful introversion of just the written word and like a way to engage with these art forms that I think maybe to me, maybe to others, feel more like vibrant and active and um, alive and extroverted. Um, like when you're playing music, you're playing for someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I bring other art forms into my work, it's like it's like a, uh, a grasp at that kind of participation and a hope that the reader um, feels the same kind of like vibrancy in my words that music conjures up uh, in a performance. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, I always think about, um, I don't know if you guys, I'm sure you've had this experience where you hear a song and you're like, oh my god, it goes so hard, like, could I do that with words? Yeah. Because right? we're writing. Yes. Yeah. And the answer is no. Like, no. you actually can <laughs> But I contend that, like, the answer is definitely no, but if you try anyway, what you do is fail really gloriously and find something you never would have found as a writer if you've just been like, yeah, whatever, I can't do that, so let me just write regularly. No, but if you, like, really, like, shoot for that, miss, and go somewhere else, it just takes you places. So that's one strategy I use with music. Um, there's, a, there's a moment in Ballad and Dagger, which is my last novel, a young adult book that they have here, um, where the kid, um, Mateo, who, he finds out he's the child of this healer god. And so he's like destined to heal people, but he's a musician at heart and he just wants to play music and he's annoyed by it. But people get getting hurt around him and all this stuff. So he's trying to heal somebody in the street and failing miserably. And the chick he's into, who's the daughter of an assassin god, um, is just watching him fail <laughs> and he looks up at her and she's like just listen for the music and it was one of those moments that right into it um, like I didn't know what the answer was I just knew he had to fail and like get it together so when she showed up and told him that I was like oh that's a great that's really smart yeah like I should have thought of it and I did but <laughs> it didn't feel like it but like that and that is also just so true of um, I said it's autobiographical basically like when I struggle with something like finding the music in whatever I'm doing almost like a soundtrack that's happening, you know, whether it's a real song or just a melody that rises, um, that's usually just how I solve anything, is finding the music in it. And that's for Matteo, you know, he hears the music of the, of the injury or the illness and learns how to kind of manipulate it. So I, I go back to that a lot when I'm writing. Um, and th there's, a, there's a Buddhist meditation practice where you think of a, something you're really good at and bring it to something you're really bad at and find the memory of what it feels like in your body to be good at that thing and bring it to the thing you suck at, um, which is how it's, you know, the Buddha said it, obviously. And so, I, you know, I think that's so powerful. And I'm actually not that great a musician, but I do feel music in a way that feels just true in my body. And so I can bring that anywhere I go, and that becomes the truth of whatever I'm doing. That's beautiful, and uh, thank you for giving me the working title of my memoir, Failing Gloriously. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, also, uh, Alex, you definitely accomplished the, the musicality in Ballad of Perilous Grace. Like, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, I know we kind of touched on it a little bit in the first question, but um, how, can you all speak a little bit to like your your researching practices when writing these stories. Um, I feel like even when I'm writing contemporary uh, <laughs> works, like in this world, I get stuck researching too much. So I'm impressed that like I don't feel like I see like the research in your when you all are building these huge worlds and building these beautiful worlds. Uh, can you all speak to about that a little bit? I mean, the research process for me is very much shaped by the process of learning to be social in a way that works in New Orleans. Um, like when you're trying to, when you're trying to get something done, when you're trying to accomplish a goal uh, and you need another person for that, you don't want to go head on right at it because uh, that comes off as like brusque and rude. So you kind of have to reach out to them on a human level, talk and let them know that you care about them as a person and what they've got going on in their life and then naturally direct things in the way that you need them to go. 
And so that's, that's what I did with the research in this a lot of the time. Um, I would just kind of go through music journalism, historical accounts, descriptions of things, um, a lot of the work of Lefkady O'Hearn, and just sort of engage with them on their own terms first. And that, to me, was the most effective and quickest way of gleaning details that I could use in the book. Yeah, I'm a historian by training, and so you would think that writing historical fiction is really easy. But I uh, never took a class on Roman history, um, so I came to this with as much knowledge as anyone walking down the street has about Rome. Um, and so I started with uh, checking out children's books from the library, where they teach you like about togas and like, you know gladiators. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. Um, so I started like a very like basic introductory level before I started specializing in what I needed my characters to know more about. Um, and so that was a really fun way for me to um, kind of revive my own love for history. Because I got to this point in like, I was studying uh, late 18th century Southern history and like got into the weeds of that and lost a little bit of joy because I wasn't feeling like I was discovering anymore. Um, and here it was just like, oh my gosh, like that happened and that happened. Um, and one of my characters in the book is, is Satan. Um, and he provides a kind of a commentary across all these centuries about what's happening to the characters, but he's also uh, interjecting these like deep histories of Rome. Like when a character passes a building, he's like, oh, like 100 years ago, that was a slaughterhouse, and 500 years ago, that was like where prostitutes baked bread. And like a thousand years ago, like the emperor kept his horses here as a stable. Um, and so you get these like compression histories that. I think for me, like exemplify everything I love about research, like weird detail, weird detail, weird <laughs> detail, go. Um, and it allowed me to like, uh, those are like the pools where I collected all like the the small things that don't really belong in the story, but I find deeply fascinating. Mm. So awesome. Um, Book of Lost Saints is a culmination of kind of a lifetime of, of family histories and, and how they mix with um, historical histories and mythologies and everything else. So a lot of the research was almost like fact checking because I grew up with these stories and um, they're all so entwined. You can't, most Cubans, like you can't really pull them separate from you know their own lives and the history of the country because um, it touches everybody. Um, to the point even that I was randomly obsessed with the Panopticon um, in college, you know, the prison that you can see everybody in. And I later found out that that was the type of prison that my uncle in Cuba had survived um, as a political prisoner for 18 years. And so a lot of this stuff was just sort of boiling up within me. So when I sat down to write, it was there. It was just a matter of like making sure that what I've been told was true, and it was. Um, the opposite of that was Dactyl Hill Squad, which is a series for kids about the Civil War, but they're riding dinosaurs the whole time. And obviously, as one does. And, <laughs> and I, I, I brought in the dinosaurs because exactly for the purpose of like not feeling too beholden to the history, and the joke was totally on me because I got obsessed with the history. And I was like, oh my god, the Battle of Chickamauga, what? And you know, like really like did a deep dive because it's so interesting, but I knew nothing about the Civil War going into it, very, very little. And my strategy for that was very much um, almost like a pyramid, you know, I would just start, I watched the Ken Burns documentary to get the overview and um, read some of the bigger books that are just like, this is the whole war and then started to really narrow in, like, okay, it, you know, after, like, 63, things start to get much more interesting because the North is actually fighting for real, and, you know, this is, these are the, just found the parts that were interesting and then got closer and closer and then really, like, narrowed in on what I was really trying to talk about, and that's really, like, where a lot of it came from. Um, and at the same time, I was writing Star Wars, so I was, I was on the Wikipedia all the time <laughs> learning about Star Wars history, which is almost as much as there is Civil War history, which is a lot. I may be in the minority, but I'm definitely more impressed about your ability to uh, fact check Cuban family history. <laughs> Not even. No, I did, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and also, uh, on a personal note, Alex, the, when the, the scene with uh, Lafcadio Hearn was just the first time I read it, which just blew me away. It was so amazing how you incorporate all that. So I really... Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, 
And then uh, the least uh, surprising fact of the month that I learned this uh, month, uh, Katie was at you had a PhD in history because I read this and I knew that. Like you just like <laughs> was that. I'm actually surprised about the that it wasn't specializing in Roman history. But yeah, no, I read the book and I was like, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Um, so you kind of, uh, with one of my favorite characters in general, Satan, you kind of brought up one of the questions that I uh, did not put uh, in our original thing, but I was just fascinated by, is that on top of building these worlds and capturing, you know, past, present, alternate universes, you all also incorporated a beautiful spiritual element in each in very different ways. And I was curious if you all could speak about how that came in uh, to each of your respective projects. That's a good question. Yeah. I apologize. No, <laughs> you're so quiet. I think sorry. Um, I mean, this, so much of this book is about the Catholic Church, so mm. like the faith is like right up front. Um, it starts in, in the second century as Christianity is just sort of uh, making its way around the suburbs of Rome um, and goes all the way up to the present day. Um, and the, the final character, the present day character, is a scientist who is um, atheist. Um, but I think for me, faith is such an interesting um, tool to understand character um, because it's something that characters have uh, driving them that is invisible um, and faith makes characters do things that are unexpected and perhaps out of character um, and so to dig into that a little bit more was kind of I think the driving force of the novel to a large extent um, the first character we meet in the second century is a 12 year old girl who ends up being a child martyr what would make a 12 year old girl volunteer to die like okay god sure well god's amorphous like that's god in some sense is meaningless so like what is what are the truths of that of that spiritual identity that resonate for a girl well here's this guy named jesus who comes along and he's talking about um weak people have power and quiet people have power and slaves have power and women have power and she's like wait a second and she starts tapping into all the ways in which she has been shut out and oppressed and not listened to, um, not only being a girl, but being young. Um, and so, it, you know, when we talk about faith, we're really talking about humanity. Um, when we talk about spirituality, we're really talking about the self and the soul. Um, and it's just a tool to, like, figure out what makes people do crazy things. Um, and so I just, I, I found it deeply exciting. Um, beyond the sort of historical weirdnesses of the Catholic Church, which are many. I think for me, faith is such um, a core element of blackness writ large, but then also in the specific version uh, of my family. Uh, so we have all of these very strong women in my family who have, have been through a lot, who have exercised their power in different ways. And so to me, those situations are inherently spiritual. They're, they're inherently important to the history of my family and, and the larger history. So it seemed very natural to begin with that. Um, you know, like my, my mother, <coughs> speaks to the dead the same way Casey's mother does in the book. Um, my, my sister Lisa, who appears in the book, is also like very spiritual and, and draws a lot on religious faith for her, for her own strength. And uh, the struggle of faith and spirituality has been one of the greatest struggles of my own personal life. Uh, so like I, I just couldn't not touch on it in a book that as much pays tribute to my family as it does to the city. Yeah, I think inherently spiritual is such a great phrase for it. Uh, so much of my writing, all my books really, really are in conversation with this crossroads of, of, of mythology, history, and memory. And But this book, more than any other, because it is so personal and so much about my own family in ways, inspired by my own family. Um, and I, I always think of 
the spirit as the best embodiment of that, right? Like there at the crossroads of all those things is spirit, um, an entity that transcends time and place and somehow stays with us throughout. And as a spiritual person myself, um, as a santero initiated into the tradition, the dead are just a very basic and normal part of, of our existence. You know, we give them food when we eat, we hang out with them and smoke cigars when we're confused. And that's just an element of the dead that uh, I always long for more of in literature because the dead are always trying to kill people. You know, <laughs> like it's always horror stories, and I think there's so much more to the dead than that. And that's um, that's something I've always been interested in exploring. But particularly with this book, because of where it stands, because of that positioning and the, that particular crossroads, it really felt like this was the time to let the dead speak, to let the spirit really just take over and run the narrative and run the table and see where that took us. And that's that was just the truth of the book from the beginning. Um, so then the question was kind of pulling that thread in a way that felt natural and, and real and to make it harmonize. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you all for that response for real. I'm, gonna, I'm hoping this is being recorded in a way that I go watch it later because I want to ruminate on this. Um, I want to get to um, <clears throat> uh, a writerly question. Uh, uh, even more so maybe, but I was curious, in particular when we hear a lot about, I think, spec fiction, especially um, spec fiction that's written by POC or by women authors, et cetera, we a lot, don't hear a lot about like the craft elements in that writing. And I was curious, like, what elements of craft do you think are different or maybe most important when working on these kind of books? What, how do you think about it, like, craft-wise, if that makes sense? Well, like what craft elements are you are you looking at exactly? I guess I'm uh, I guess I'm kind of curious. So like I've thought I've asked a lot about like world building, but I guess I'm curious. Like, do you think maybe is it characters? Is it plot driven? Is it like do you think more maybe rhythm of sentences is more important? Like what elements? I guess when on the actual writer, like line level, what are you thinking about um, when it comes to uh, working in these kind of genres? I think for me it's mostly about character uh, because I believe that story is expressed through character. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I can conjure the characters for myself in such a way as they seem autonomous from my own mind mm -hmm. and my own life, um, I can let them surprise me and use them to find surprising specific details both in the world and in the situations in which they find themselves. Yeah, I think what I'm most interested in craft-wise is sentences. Um, and I think maybe historical fiction suffers from too much of a devotion to the plot. I think a lot of readers of historical fiction obviously like want to find out like what happened. It's history. What are the things that happened? Um, and I'm less interested in that, um, maybe to the detriment of my books. Um, but I'm so attracted to language and sound and rhythm. Um, I love reading poetry. I'm not a poet, but like all of my work is just like a reaching towards that, um, a glorious failing. Um, and so I think if there's a way to make history come alive, it's not through plot, it's through image. Um, and sound, uh, so I think that's what I'm most focused on. Mm. That's so interesting. I'm a big story dude, um, <laughs> but I love that. And and I knew with this book, um, this was this was going to be different for me. I really set out to. Whereas everything else I've written is very much entrenched in genre, um, which I think of as very explicitly story driven. Mm -hmm. This um, wasn't going to be that, but it, I still wanted it to encompass elements of genre. Um, whether that's in the fantastical, it's sort of a murder mystery told from the person who was murdered. It's, you know, sort of a historical drama. It's a lot of different things. Um, but I also knew that I wanted it to be very grounded in just people's lives, everyday lives, but not at the cost of story. And I think the premise that I set out to do was make, like, make sure that the story was always moving forward, even if it was inching forward at times, but that it was also that um, we weren't throwing away sort of the everyday life of it just to get on with the story. And that's that's hard because I'm trained in like, 
you know, Star Wars. Like you get the um, you get the the thing you're looking for, and then you have to run off to another because the Empire is coming and etc. Mm -hmm. And so I had to sort of resist some of those impulses and just really, I think all storytelling is a process of listening first and foremost. And whenever I teach writing, you know, listening is the first thing that, that we talk about because it's also one of the things we don't talk enough about in classes and in MFA programs, uh, the importance of listening. Whether it's to ourselves, uh, whether we're reflecting on our own process or experience of writing, or whether it's listening to the story, um, which I think is the most important thing, listening to the people around us, the voices of the people around us, all of that. And this story really had a particular rhythm that it wanted to be in. And I knew that that was true because there were parts of me being like trying to bucket at times and be like, wait, no, don't we need like a plot point here? And we did, but like we could bring it in subtly, right? We could take it, uh, we could start a little earlier. And, and I enjoyed that. Um, it was almost just a process of kind of letting it go and, and giving over to it, not full control, just like, oh, whatever it's gonna be, you know, it wasn't a blah, 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 like that. But um, it was like very much a conversation between myself and the story. And I think it's always there, but this again, like just felt very different. So I tried to honor that. And you did. <laughs> Another thing I noticed in all of your works, um, in these books, but I feel like in general, from what I've read of you all, is that you, uh, they all incorporated storytelling elements that traversed through generations, mm -hmm. like different generations speaking to each other, plots and story following through different generations. Can you speak a little bit about how you all uh, work that into these stories and what made you all gravitate to that in general? But for me, that was like a really foundational piece of the book. So much of this book is, just comes from the experience of being the child of an exile, you know, and, and um, you know, my mom, who I grew up knowing, is just this mom, you know, mom, like whatever, mommy. And, uh, you know, the person that picks you up from karate practice and tucks you in at night, and then learning that she had like survived this war and literally dodged bullets and, and uh, snuck contraband into prisons to help out her, her brother and, all, you know, just lived this really wild, exciting, incredible espionage-filled life um, as a younger person. And just reconciling those two things, you know, um, was mind-blowing in the best way. Um, and I think we all, we all walk around with that on a certain level. Like, uh, that's the generational conversation, is that different people have these different experiences and some of them are incredible and terrifying and some of them are very mundane. And sometimes we only know one side of people. So it's baked into the premise that there's this, this entity that's, that's lived through these incredibly horrible, dramatic, tragic, and also life-affirming experiences, um, literally haunting this man who's just living a very regular mundane life and that, that those things coexist and that, again that's the crossroads moment of, of literature i think is that all those pieces happen at the same time simultaneously even as they happen over the span of history and over the span of generations and so that was kind of the challenge that i set out for myself in, in writing this book yeah i'm a huge proponent of simultaneity mm -hmm. it's all happening at once all the time um and history is taught as a linear progression um, we learn about the things that happened first, and then we get, you know, in high school up to like maybe the Vietnam War if your teacher is like doing a good job with time management. But like, <laughs> the great thing about visiting Rome for me was seeing how that city preserved all the layers of history at once. So you're walking around the Forum, but you see like there's a church that has like a, you know, a Mithraeum in the basement and like a second century church built on top of it, and then like the Renaissance church where they like stole stones from the Colosseum to build on top of that. And nothing's covering anything. It's all visible. Um, and so all those dead people are alive at once. Um, and if you think about simultaneity as being like a, a part of life, then you get to tap into ancestors. Then you get to participate in conversations that happened before you were born. Um, then you realize that your own life is not a linear progression, that you can keep looping back mm -hmm. on yourself, mm -hmm. which presents so many cool possibilities for ways to live. I think for me, one of the most important elements about uh, of fantasy fiction is the sense of culture shock. And so since my dad worked for the State Department and was a Foreign Service officer um, for most of my life, I, I experienced literal culture shock many times. 
but uh, the first time I experienced it was as a really small child, like trying to get a handle on the language, the customs, like what I was expected to know and what it was okay not to know. Um, and I, I very much felt an echo of that uh, for years when I moved to New Orleans. So since my family was such a large part of like figuring out how to be in the world, it, it seemed necessary for me to include them uh, in this book as well. Yeah. So, you know, the things I love most in my life, my family, it, it just seemed natural. I love the notion of being in conversation with history. And uh, it's just, that, that really jumped out to me when I was researching Back to the Hill Squad. Before I knew that I was writing that book, I was reading about some of the uh, orphanages in, there's something called the Colored Orphans Asylum in Midtown Manhattan. And it was like a side note in this book, In the Shadow of Slavery, by uh, Leslie Harris. That's an amazing book. And they just mentioned offhand, like, there were these, uh, like, six Cuban sisters who were in that asylum. And they were kind of, like, dropped off mysteriously and then whisked away again and kind of lost to history. And it was just this tiny little thing. And I was like, oh, there were Cubans here? You know what I mean? Like, it was like, duh. Like, you know, it was 1860, whatever. Of course, there were Cubans in New York. But it just had never occurred to me because you never read about them. And that one side note, and then I was like, what if they could ride pterodactyls, you know? And, like, <laughs> that turned into this entire series, like, literally a three-book series. And it just really... To me, that, that moment for me always speaks to the power of, of representation. And like, I think representational politics are rightfully critiqued on a lot of levels in that it's not enough, but it, it does matter so much and it changes lives, not just because it's like, wow, I can see myself in a hero, which is extremely important, but also because it puts us in conversation with history in a way that we weren't before until the, the, the reality of history is open. And that's the piece of it too. It's not even like, you know, there's like a, a false narrative, like, Cubans were there, you know, and that simple thing just woke up, you know, the, the kind of um, memories and the ability to fantasize and imagine what that might have been like in a different way. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, does anyone, uh, we have time for a little bit of Q&A. If anyone has any questions, if not, I'm going to keep pestering them. But Michael. Yeah, question. Um, sorry, this is not like a little curious so uh, I'm just I'm curious for each of you. What are you looking to preserve in your work? As in, as in, what's the truth? What's the light um, in everything that you write that, that you're looking to to maybe protect privately? That makes sense. And that then that may be a type of writing. That may be something that's true to you. Daniel talked about family. That's a bit. But what, I guess what's something that you feel like is unique for each of you? People talk about the why all the time. Maybe that's the why. Mm. Maybe it's not. Like why we write. Well, what, what do you, what do you, Katie, look to, to protect in your work? You know, the history of literature, you see yourself in the line of that. Mm. Is this something that, you know, uh, you as a, as a child were writing? So this is, this is preserving that, you know, those, those dates? I'm, I'm getting very personal, so. That's a great question. I think I'm looking to uh, protect joy and uh, the, the beauty of blackness, largely. Um, because those are, the, those are the things most important to me, especially in my own work. Um, and just looking at the way my field has changed since I first started reading science fiction and fantasy, um, those two elements are so important and I, I've been blessed to have help from so many people along the way um, that I just feel like that's what I have to preserve. I guess I would say I'm, I'm trying to preserve weirdness and the beauty of mortality. I'm really interested in mortality. And like not as a scary thing, but as like a, a curiosity. I think in the in the large scale of my work, it's uh, so much about rooted in moments like the one I just described. You know, and I think uh, putting readers who haven't historically been able to be in conversation with whether it's history or science fiction or you know a galaxy far, far away, like opening up those worlds to folks 
who usually get cut out of those worlds. So that not only do they read and enjoy them, but they can see themselves in them, and then they can imagine themselves creating those worlds. That's a huge part of um, what I do across the board. But with Book of Los Angeles specifically, so much of it is about how loud uh, the two, the sort of false binary of, of uh, the Cuban conversation is, and how much money and power is invested in, in either side, and wanting to stake out a, a claim and a, a territory that's not one side or the other, but also not like some middling in between bullshit either, um, if that makes sense. Because I think there's a danger to like middle roading everything and being like, well, both sides are kind of messed up, so I don't know. It's not that. It's like there's there's a there's a viable um, cry for freedom within you know not wanting to live in an oppressive government and also not believing that the U.S. should uh, control everything in the whole world. And uh, I think those voices you know, they need to be heard, like we need to be heard. And th 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 that's my experience of Cubans here and in Cuba. Um, but we just never get that narrative because Miami is so loud and Havana is so loud and their defenders are so loud. And there's a lot to defend and there's a lot to hate. <laughs> and I think we need to have that conversation with nuance and complexity and it's so hard to do. And the novel is the only way that I could figure out to do it because trying to have it in nonfiction just never worked for me. I always felt Miami was pretty quiet. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have a, a question, Miami or not? Uh, talking about crap, and also talking about timelines and some of them, I mean, do you find your, what do each of you do to, to keep track of what initially is an arbitrary world very often, or also a very complicated historical place, <coughs> not one that you're immediately intuitively aware of and also with timelines that may get very complicated. Are you surrounded by notebooks? Do you using computer programs that with time because they're timeline programs? How are you keeping track of all of this uh, sometimes confusing detail? And and do you succeed or do you, <laughs> you go, oh my God, someday when you're reading a proof I mean it depends. I I do collect a lot of articles. I have um, a lot of notes that I take. They're usually in my phone or on my computer, uh, but sometimes I do them longhand. Um, and I think I've done an all right job of keeping track of these details so far, um, but I'm probably gonna have to find a new way of doing that for my next book, because just as this one is sort of like big and dense and the story sprawls, like the next one is going to be much more straight ahead and to the point. Uh, so I'm going to have to be a little bit more organized. I, I do not outline uh, to my peril. <laughs> um, I don't have a program that I use. I get really messy and then reread and find my own messes and figure out how to fix them. Um, I will say that when I finished writing this book, I wrote it as sort of four novellas, um, second century, ninth century, 16th century, present day. And I knew that I didn't want them to be chronological because this history is not necessarily chronological. And so I chopped them up and then started moving them around. And it was like a really interesting shell game where it's like, does this make sense here? Does this make sense here? And I was moving like 100 page chunks around just to see like where the resonances were. And if you put like the back end of one section and the front end of the other section together, does that make a beautiful animal or does that make a monster? Um, so that was the, the time of writing where I got most uh, sort of in, in, the, in the weeds of um, thinking about structure. Do you use Scribner? Oh my god. There's a program called Scribner. Yeah. I, don't, I couldn't do that without... I use Word and it's just chaos. Amazing. Wow. And I've heard about Scribner and Scribner's it's like, amazing. It's supposed to be life-changing. It is because you can have those chunks just like, you can literally like pick up this chapter and move it somewhere instead of being like, I must copy and paste yeah. you know, like, which is why Word crashes. Yeah, all it. the time. I highly recommend it. Yes. Um, so, I, but I'm like, when I wrote this book, I was in a phase, which was true of most of my career, where I was also not an outliner. And I actually hated outlines because it felt like it robbed the process of all that good chaos, which is why I was writing. I was writing for the chaos. You know, I love that. What's going to happen? I have no idea. I have to write to find out. And that was a lot of the impulse behind writing. 
This book in particular is very complex in that not only is it two timelines, it's structured in a way where the past is constantly catching up to the future and they kind of merge towards the end, um, which is super complicated. And for whatever reason, I just sat down and wrote the book like start to finish and it kind of worked. Um, but I've since become a huge, extremely meticulous outliner, mostly because now I write in comics and you have to outline comics, otherwise you'll just you know, blow it 100% all the time. And it's not fun to not have an outline in comics like it is for a novel. So, and now I literally just bought a bulletin board so that I can like actually like really get a serial killer weird on it and, and all those levels of it. So I love that stuff, but with this book and for a large portion of my career, I was just like, oh, let's see what happens. I think maybe we have time for one more question, so. Yeah. Um, this is at heart a conversation about genre. And each century sees the emergence of new genres within it. We can look backwards in time and we can see kind of you know, the arrival of new ways of telling stories we didn't have before. We are at the beginning of this century still, writ large. What is what genres do you see emerging now for storytelling that as readers you are most excited about? I don't think you can um, downplay the importance of social media in this conversation, quite honestly. Like, storytelling has blown up in ways on social media that, on the one hand, I understand the sort of knee jerk, like, uh, social media. <laughs> on the other hand, like, storytelling has become conversational in a way that, at its heart, it's always supposed to be but we've lost a lot of in the process of lifting up the novel as like the sole, or even the movie, as like the sole kind of like storytelling representative in our world. But social media has created a, a forum, and I say this as Twitter is literally spiraling to the ground. Um, but you know, a forum where storytelling has once again become this conversation where now the audience is interacting and the, and the audience interaction determines the course of the story. You can see it on TikTok, um, you know, where the limitations also really create fascinating kind of divergences from what the story would have been because now you have to tell it in a minute or you know use emojis or gifs or gifs and so i think that's fascinating i think that's amazing to look at it is also full of toxicity and everything else but like what story form isn't you know what i mean like the novel has absolutely been responsible for horrific um, changes in human events and so has the movie and we still love them and we have to be able to criticize them and love them at the same time and that's sort of what it is so I would look to that and I would say like the blessing of it is that it, it, there's a level of it that brings it, us back to some of the true heart of storytelling that I think we've lost sight of. Yeah that's a really good answer I think uh, there's kind of like a necessary fracturing that's happening mm -hmm. that is going to continue to be important as people figure out ways to um, harness it um, I'm particularly interested recently, maybe in the past year or so, with um, works of fiction that, or poetry or essays that use sort of found forms. Um, so I, I recently read Alejandro Zombra's Multiple Choice, which is based on a standardized test that he took in Chile, and it's it's just a series of multiple choice questions for like 200 pages, wow. and it's so smart and it just like exploded my sense of like what a story is. Um, I read a short story by Beth Pia Toad that's board game instructions. Um, I think about like the work that Sheila Hetty is doing with her old diary entries in the New York Times where she's just taking the first sentence of every diary entry and then alphabetizing them. Um, and it's like every, every time I read something like that my head twists and I'm like oh yeah what? Um, I just love that feeling, and so I think there's a lot of room for exploration there and in finding stories and things that we don't think of as narrative. I think for me, there is a kind of pastiche that is emerging, I think, partly as a result of the way um, intellectual property is handled and the way people's lives and imaginations interact with it, and I find it enormously thrilling to sort of try to take the pop culture that I've been devouring all my life and take images, tropes, or characters from it and recontextualize them to make them my own and, and put them in a circumstance that illuminates some aspect of the human condition that I'm interested in. And uh, that's what I've done here with Pippi Longstocking. Uh, and I see more and more people doing it. Like there's a lot of, uh, 
Peter Pan based stuff mm -hmm. coming out right now, and uh, I'm I'm very interested in that. <laughs> Peter Pan genre. Didn't it just enter the public domain? Yeah, I think I think so. Yeah, I think that's what happened. Which is so interesting because that that legality t transforms culture, right? Like suddenly we can we can do this stuff. Winnie the Pooh did too, but like Disney has a, a lock on him having a, a red shirt and no pants. You know, what I mean? like it's like this is culture and it's being you know litigated, which is also just how it's always been. But it's interesting to look at, right? So in like a hundred years, I can use that Beach Boys song. Yes, yes. Just hold out. You can do it. <laughs> 50, 50 more years. <laughs> yeah. You're halfway there. Halfway there. Just gotta hang on. I think before they like play violins to get me up, us off stage, I think we've hit it. But I just want to thank our panelists one more time. For thank you.